Vendor Ops, levelling up your vendor management. Welcome to another episode of The Bridge Podcast. I'm your host, Nick Francis. I'm the Chief Technology and Marketing Officer for Brooklyn Vendor Assurance. Today, I'm joined by Rob Strongock from Mast. Um, Rob will be taking us through his career history, but he is a Chief Product Officer and a also fellow SaaS startup entrepreneur and B2B advocate. Um, Rob, welcome to The Bridge Podcast. We normally talk about vendor management and the, the pitfalls or opportunities and, and threats of such, but today we're doing something a bit different. You are a SaaS um, entrepreneur, like myself. Co- are you a co-founder as yeah, well? Yeah, co-founder as well. So I'm a co-founder. So we are going to compare war stories or experiences, hopefully get some kind of insight out of it for the listeners. But we always like to talk a bit about hot news and what's happening in the world right now and bring it back to the topic of conversation, which today is about startup life, etc. Ben, what's our first topic of conversation? So... Mark McGann has leaked thousands of documents revealing that Uber had aggressively lobbied top ministers in undeclared meetings. Is this behaviour unique to Uber, or is it indicative of the startup mentality to win at any costs? I, I wouldn't have said startup mentality is to win at any costs. There's, there's always a cost of winning, and it's 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 what you're willing to do in the space in which you play, right? And I think it's back to your values and your behaviours as an organisation and, and what you want to be. We, we were talking earlier today from a marketing sense about tone of voice mm. and branding mm. and I think that that travels through into what are you willing to do, how are you willing to market yourself, how out there do you want to put yourself um, and in, in today's world you have to be a bit edgy to get noticed right? otherwise you're just <laughs> bland and mundane and you need to be willing to upset someone in some in some shape or form. How do you, how do you deal with it in a in your business today? That's a tricky one. Um, you know, we're in a similar uh, similar environment and we're both B2B. Um, and I feel for me that there should be a set, not a sense of formality, but a, a sense of professionalism. And I don't think we can take the chances that uh, direct-to-consumer startups can because our pool of customers is much smaller mm. than theirs. Um, and we are like incredibly product-driven. And so for us, um, I, I question the value of big marketing spend. I think a lot of it for us is, is word of mouth and references and just demonstrations of the product. So for us, it's if we can get in front of someone through an introduction or referral, that's worth its weight in gold rather than um, marketing spend. So is, is referral your your biggest um, or sales conversion? Is, is through referral and word of mouth. It's been good for us. Um, it normally is more of a, I guess, a, 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 like seals a deal. Uh, customers don't generally talk to us, get a demo, speak to someone else to, to get a to verdict on us. Um, we found sort of industry consultants a really useful way um, just because they've got great networks. You've seen everything else in the market. They know what's good, what's not. And, and it's great for us because we get feedback on our product as well. So, um, you know, and, and it's kind of it builds relationships. They then work with the clients as well, and um, that kind of that, that strategy works for us. In the, that sentiment, you think reading this, Uber did anything wrong? Uber had aggressively lobbied top ministers in undeclared meetings. Yeah, I think if anything's undeclared, that's a, that's a red flag for me. And it goes back to what we said earlier about um, it's you should be upholding the, the spirit of the rules as well as just the lines. I think it's an interesting one. Um, the the, the 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 phrase win at all costs i think for for us it's probably survive at all costs we're not at that stage yet it's we need to do what we can to survive but obviously the challenges that we face are being very difficult for us to break break any rules yeah. um just, you know we're not in a position where we could it's more about you said about conduct isn't it b2b conduct needs to be seen to be at the right level of professionalism. Yeah. I, I read this statement and I, at face value, I don't think Uber have done anything wrong per se to, to aggressively lobby. That's sales, right? So you expect your guys to be aggressively selling your product all the time, right? Um, in the right spirit of the manner, yeah. in, in the right term of aggressive, not actually aggressive, <laughs> just doing it with sort of dedication and a bit of um, drive, right? Yeah. Um, undeclared meetings, that's a minister's problem. Uh, maybe. Um, 
I see what you're saying, and that Uber did nothing wrong. It was the ministers that should have. Yeah, so if you, them. if you went and sold your product, your sales guys went and sold your product to a company, and they had a policy where they should declare any sales meeting they've got with the product. Yep. That wouldn't be your fault, would it? No, but I th- I think if I if I think about what Uber's done, I think they have gone for sort of the land grab strategy. They've they've gone for the classic act first, ask for forgiveness, and and lobby mm. for forgiveness. Um, and I think that is slightly different um, because it would almost be like if I sold a product that harmed people's health and I hadn't gone through the right approval processes to get my product approved, yep. whatever it may be, and then to lobby the government to change those that regulation once I've been found out, that to me doesn't seem like a, a right way to go about doing no. things. Um, regulation is there to protect the customer. There are lots of customers that need regulation to help them make an informed decision. I think it sounds like you, you know more about this specific topic than I do. So I'm going to probe a little bit into that. So there's a lot of things in terms of, I used to deal with a lot of regulation having both of us got overlap in Barclays, right? So I used to deal with a lot of regulation in Barclays. And at the time it was when we was moving to mobile technologies. Mm-hmm. Mobile technologies predominantly other than BlackBerry, which they cornered the, owned the market until they were disrupted by the iPhone. And what started happening then was a consumer tech started to come in. So we would, and to use the word, we would lobby regulators because their policies were out of date against the tech that was being used, right? So um, they'd ask for things that had no equivalent in modern tech. So you could say, well, I can't really comply with your policy Mm -hmm. because that particular thing doesn't exist in in new technology. Um, Do do you feel that was the way that Uber was taking this or was they literally trying to say, you need to change it and for the the worst rather than it needs to be modernized? I seem to, I, I, I can't remember if this is completely correct, but from memory, what I read at one point is that whilst Boris Johnson was mayor of London, he was refusing to bend TFL rules for Uber to let them operate in London. It was something like that. There was certain restrictions they had to comply with. Um, someone they lobbied had a big stake in a fund that was invested in Uber. Uber knew that person on first name terms and said, we need to get them to put pressure on Boris Johnson so we can act as we want. Uh, act as Uber, you know, so Uber can get the regulation changed how they want it to. And that's when it, I think it gets a bit... But what was the regulation to operate in London? I can't remember exactly. It would have been something to do with the... I think it was something to do with the five-minute waiting rule that if you pre-book it, if, you, if you're doing a pre-booked minicab, the earliest you can book it is five minutes in advance. Right. And so the Uber on-demand model would have fallen foul of this. And so there was pressure to change that so you could do like an instant book. You can see what I'm saying though, because what you didn't know about it and what I was saying about what we was doing, there's a level of, well, that's the modern way, way the world is going, this yeah. internet ordering. So you're just trying to stop progress for something that's old and draconian and needs to be rebooted and updated. Mm. Right or wrong, you 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 need to decide kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's a it's, tough one. It is tough. It is tough. Yeah, you've got the whole thing about competition and locking out into an area because that's transport for London, right? Mm-hmm. They want to keep the competition out, but you let the competition in and back to what we do, the best product, may the best products win yeah. kind of thing in the space and the most innovative and those that have got the best team behind it. Yeah. Um, if you were locked out of something because of a regulation, you'd be a bit... We, we see it actually so we see less, less so uh, we used to see a lot of um, no cloud policy in big companies mm. until they sort of understood the cloud was secure enough etc and it, and it, that, that's almost you're forgoing yourself a lot of opportunity because you're trying to manage risk but your policy is such a blanket statement that who's it benefiting yeah yeah you're it's uh, you're protecting yourself from a world that's five years old yeah, yeah. Things have moved on. You need to update. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. Yeah, and you see, like, uh, I said, not the, the Boris and his innovation track. It's, it's hard to innovate when you've got old policies, right? I think just to do one more thing though. There are other examples of, of this kind of behaviour though. Quite recently, I saw an article on, uh, I think it's Glovo, um, who, and the, the basic report came out that 
they were completely ignoring any kind of advice from their internal council on competition. And they had worked with Delivery Hero and kind of colluded and were breaking antitrust laws. And the founders just had no regard for the rules around competition. They saw competition as bad, whereas the, the council were like, no, competition is kind of essential. You, you can't be a monopoly. Yeah. We have to respect the rules. Um, and they tried to exit a country, did it, and then the regulators forced them back into it. Um, and they did eventually exit it again. I think it was Egypt. Um, but I think that is another example of founders just ignoring what the legislation says. Um, whether it's across every founder, I don't know. But again, becoming a founder attracts a certain type of personality. And it is, I'm going to do this at all costs or, or I'm going to do this when everyone tells me I'm wrong. And I think it's it's understandable that those personalities might not see the rules in the same way. We are living through these times of, uh, I think, where everything was pre-internet, not even sort of necessarily pre-internet, but pre kind of these gig economy, Uber connectivity, where where you had, it was all reliant on geographic boundaries, right? And it were written, and all the policies were written about a geographic boundary. And the more and more we evolve into this internet, everything of things connected everywhere, that the digital boundaries are not playing well with the the, the, the geographic boundaries. Um, and I say this where you get, you get standards like GDPR and stuff that's going to that's starting to lock in norm like across Europe, etc. It's starting to normalise. But you're interested over the next decade how that plays out and how the digital economy sets its own policy at, at an internet level, but and a, a local geography level because there's, there's got to be some play or interaction between the two of them. Yeah, I mean, there's so many services that you know, even as a as a, a as a company, we use plenty of SaaS software that comes from the states, and we get billed in dollars, and they've got no footprint in the UK or in Europe. What happens there? Because the sales in the UK technically, but we're paying in dollars, and the, pro- the payments being processed in the states. Does the UK's regulatory arm re- reach that far? It's, a, it's just tricky questions that I don't think. Like you said, I don't think we're, the, the government or the, or the regulators are probably ready for. Yeah, grey area. Yeah. yeah it, it, it it takes me back to, did you see the thing when Mark Zuckerberg met like the committee like a few years ago and the questions they were asking uh, around yeah. digital was like, <laughs> it was embarrassingly bad and like just the internet and the way that the apps worked and just sort of that epitomises, that's extreme, right? But that epitomises the difference in understanding and those setting the laws and the policies and regulating it, you, you almost need specialists from, you, and I know they do this consulting, right? But you, you almost need those people to come in and set the policy. But then you've got that concept of back to this, which could be Fox watching Hen House because it's in their interests, but you need someone who understands it to that degree yeah. to police it. Um, again, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, just to talk about sort of fostering innovation and that kind of thing, I can't imagine Boris Johnson knowing how to set up his Sky Plus to record the right TV show, let alone understanding some of the complex problems that, that founders are trying to solve. And maybe that's a bit mean to him, but you're right. Like the, the kind of the understanding of what's going on in the tech world and what people are doing is, is so beyond the reach of, of many people in, in those positions of power. I mean, it's just high need for collaboration, right? And there used to be a very good and strong culture at collaborating, like we said earlier, against the spirit of what you're trying to achieve that's right for the right for the times and right for the, the people in the companies it's trying to regulate. Yeah. Hot news done. There you go. <laughs> Rob, do you want to introduce yourself, start a bit with uh, what happened to bring you here today? Absolutely, yeah. Thank you for having me. Um so, uh, going, I guess the best way to start is just going way, way back to my first work experience. Both my parents are were, were chartered accountants, and I thought, go and see what what that's like. And I did, some, did two weeks of work experience in a local company in the accounting department. Looked at um, Excel all day and thought, 
I'm never doing this again. And just <laughs> ruled that out and said, it is not for me. I need to speak to some other humans and get outside um, and do something else. But I always like numbers. I always like maths. And I really liked economics at school. So I kind of wanted something that, that fit in between. Went off to uni, studied economics, stayed on and did a master's in behavioral science and economics. Applied to all the usual internships at the investment banks, uh, asset managers. What did you want to do at that point? I thought I wanted to go into the city and and do something where I was going to use the economic knowledge and also get to speak to people. So I was looking at kind of sales roles in, in investment banks, like sales and trading, um, or being kind of like a wealth manager or an asset manager, those kind of things. But I never really did very well in any of the interviews. Got a few, got to sort of the last stage on a couple of them, but, but never made it. Um, and... I ended up joining a Barclays grad scheme and I thought I wanted to be a relationship director in a corporate coverage team. And it's basically like a, you know, account manager for large companies. If they want a loan, they come to you, you go find the right person in the bank and you go and, you know, hash it out and work out what the deal's going to be. When did you join Barclays? What year was that? I was in 2016. All right, yeah, a bit after. I, I, I ended up when I got to, I was a, when I was a director level in Barclays, I used to do a lot of the grad recruiting schemes. Ah, I used to go okay. and they booked out a hotel. So I'd spend literally days at a time in an, a hotel room where the bed had been moved over. And there was a desk in there <laughs> seeing like hundreds of grads come through. And there was like me and 40 of my colleagues was fast tracking all the grads through the same. Did you do a similar sort of speed dating process? Uh, kind of, did, did a few. I did one at JP Morgan that was just pretty brutal. I did one at... Um, RBC it was quite tough. The Barclays one was, yeah, I think there were like 40 people on the day, split into groups of 10, um, individual stuff, and then like a group challenge. Um, and I'd done about three or four assessment days, assessment centers, what they, what they call them. Um, and every time the feedback was, you were brilliant on like one, two, three, four, but the fifth one, you missed it. And every single assessment center, it seemed to be a different one that I had right. failed. So I was getting really frustrated. No consistent opinion. Then. Yeah. But at the Barclays one, I just did everything kind of clicked and it was a bit of a, you know, right head space. I'd done the prep, went in feeling confident, knew what I needed to do and got there. So, um, and I got what was my dream job. I wanted to join this grad scheme, which was the uh, PCB grad scheme at the time, personal corporate and Barclay card. Yeah. And it meant that I would be able to do rotations in the corporate bank, the retail bank, the wealth management side, and if I wanted to, in the Barclay card. What office did they put you in? I was in Canary Wharf in 1CP. I moved Barclays Wealth into 1CP ah, okay, in yeah. 2007. Okay. And then spent a lot of my career in South and North Colonnade. No, they're, they're, they're nice offices. Uh, what floor was you on? I was all over the place. I did uh, some time on level 11. Then I went up to 24, down to 23. I think a bit of time on 13. How long was you there? Uh, three and a half years. But they were refurbing it whilst I was there. So we got, we got shunted around a bit. And on this grad scheme, I did three different rotations in two years. So that was part of the moving around as well. Um, yeah. No, I, I have some really fond memories of, of being there. Met some great managers and uh, some fun people that I'm still in contact with now. But I sort of did, did the rotations and I didn't get any of the rotations I wanted at any point. So I was very frustrated. Um, and then I got like my dream job that I really wanted, which was being a, an associate director in the private equity coverage team. So I basically was like the assistant to a relationship manager for private equity funds. We did a specific type of funding for private equity funds. And I wrote lots of credit lines for FX. And I had a little portfolio of my own clients as well. And I thought, this is what I wanted to do. This is what I was working towards. Got there, did it for a year and thought, oh, actually, I don't see myself doing this for another 35 years. Um, I had a bit of entrepreneurial experience growing up. What was the growing up entrepreneurial thing? So uh, at school, we had this program, which was the Aundel Charity Ventures. Aundel is my hometown. And the idea was you formed a group and you came up with a uh, you know, a business idea and you'd go off and you'd make it reality and you'd sell it. And it, you know, it was kind of like, well, I don't know, you, people would come up with these different ideas of products that they would sell and make and that kind of thing. And um, a, 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 the great example was that um, the year before a team had taken photos of all the teachers at our school posing in um, old movie scenes. So they'd gone to the wardrobe department of the school theater and dressed them all up as like Charlie Chaplin or whatever, and these or James Bond, and taken these timeless kind of classic photos of 
of these, you know, films that everyone's seen, but using the teachers and it was brilliant. And they sold you know, thousands of pounds of these calendars. And um, what we did was we made our own Monopoly board. So we took photos of our town, went to the official producer of, of Monopoly boards, got like an official Monopoly board made for Oundel, um, went out, sold it, also pre-orders to fund the initial yeah. order, got the boxes, kept on selling them. And uh, yeah, we, we think we did sort of like 13,000 pounds in sales. Um, in, in sorry, in profit, um, which was pretty good, I thought. And then um, someone saw what we'd done and matched it in a donation, which was great. Um, and yeah, I was on BBC Look East, and I really hope they've deleted the footage because I had the worst haircut imaginable and uh, gave a terrible answer to a question. <laughs> and how old were you at the time? I would have been 16, 17. Right, so Barclays, you wanted to leave three and a half years? Yes. So a few of my friends had also left their jobs to start their own businesses. Um, one of them is the co-founder of uh, NOAA, which is a student starter kit business. And they've grown to sort of like 25, 30 employees now. And I remember just watching him go on that journey and it just seemed so interesting and exciting. And it kind of, I didn't think it was possible, you know, to, to give up the, the day job and do this, but seeing someone that I knew do it and be successful was really eye-opening. Two guys at Barclays did the same thing. They run a company called Airhead and they make kind of anti-pollution masks for commuters. And, that, you know, they, they were running this as a sort of a side hustle whilst at Barclays said, you know what, we're making enough money to do it full time. They left. So that kind of really inspired me that someone else is. What was the, in 1CP, there was a Barclays tech hub. Was it level 39? Level 39 is in, um, it was the Citigroup Tower. Um, and there's Barclays Rise, which was oh, like Rise a, or something up there. There are yeah, any of these, in these part of Barclays backing. No, no, they're, they're, separate. they're just separate. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then one more had gone through Entrepreneur first, and he uh, is a co-founder of, or was a co-founder of um, a company called Pave, and it was originally called Portify. Um, again, successful startup. Um, he's now moved on to something in, something new, but it was all these people that I'd known. Uh, were were leaving their corporate jobs or leaving what they were doing before, moving to something new and and being successful. <laughs> I didn't hear of anyone failing, and I was like, I've got to get in on this. I've got to do something because I don't want to get stuck in the rat race. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it gets to a point where you get paid too much and it's too cushy. You don't want to leave. And I was at that the, just a sweet spot where I thought I had enough experience. I still had this burning desire to do something else, um, and I was kind of I was kind of waiting for the idea. Like I had explored ideas with a friend. And we kind of did a bit of research into them. We were going to start an underwear brand. We got some samples made. That's a bit different. Yeah. And I still think it's a great idea. And it's sort of like 12 to 18 months afterwards, suddenly we started seeing men and men's underwear startup brands pop up everywhere. Rihanna, wasn't it? Did a men's underwear brand or so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we, we were inspired by this one called MeUndies in uh, California, which we thought was a terrible name, but they are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It's almost like a joke, getting the me undies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I guess it works. Yeah. Um, Sticks in your mind. So that really kind of drove me to do something different. And I, uh, seeing uh, Chris go through Entrepreneur First really inspired me to apply. And my friend Jake, that I was doing some of this research with, said, uh, You know, I talked to him about this idea I had about mortgages. And he said, That mortgages idea. Explain Entrepreneur, entrepreneur First a bit. So Entrepreneur First is a bit like a startup incubator, um, but they, uh, I guess they're called like sort of talent investors. So rather than investing in teams, they'll invest in individuals. Yeah. And by investment, they kind of give you a bit of personal runway to last you 10, 12 weeks. And you do kind of a, a program with them where they, uh, you know, they kind of coach you into forming a team and building an idea and pitching it. Um, and I ended up joining a program called Antler, which is very similar. Um, talent investor and I, I sort of describe it as Love Island meets The Apprentice meets Dragon's Den mm. you get 70 uh, singletons they're all wanting to start their own business you're talking you're interacting with each other you're working out whether you're a good fit as a team and then you have some group challenges as well and this kind of helps Antler work out whether you're the right kind of person to invest in but they don't really sort of tell you what they're thinking at this stage it's all kind of a bit hush hush and then you form a team um, whenever you're ready. You will start working as a team and you pitch every Friday and you get feedback on your ideas. Um, and that's kind of the Dragon's Den bit where you've got this business idea. You're effectively asking for investment every Friday and they sort of say, well, you should think about this, that or the other. 
And then on the final Friday of the program, or the final week of the program, you're doing it for real and you're, you're pitching to investors and it's... That almost sounds like a, a, a sort of X Factor pop idol <laughs> manufacture the band yeah. process, right? It'd be an amazing TV show. The next version of The Apprentice. Next version of The Apprentice. But I'm going to say the, the caliber of people there was, was really impressive. And these are all people that... Uh, ne- they wanted the next job was to do that. It was like a, I suppose it was an interview process as well. Yep. But you're not actually you're not interviewing for a company. You're interviewing for an idea. Yeah. Of a company. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so you, you go through an interview process to get on the program, and it's like three thousand applicants for fifty places, six, sixty places, something like that. Um, so it's incredibly selective, and they don't care what your idea is at that stage. It's more, do you have the right? Um, mentality, attributes. Indicators. Right? Yeah. And, and do you have an unfair advantage? I think they call it this, like, do you have a spike that that sets you apart from the average person in some way? And mine was my sort of knowledge of the mortgage sector. We spent a lot of time talking about mortgages in my interview, even though we weren't supposed to, but that was my that was my spike. Um, and so they get all these people together who, are, who they think fit the mold. Um, and then it's up to you to work out who actually you have the chemistry with. Um, who do you share the same values with, same goals, aspirations? Um, and that's really interesting because you, you very, very quickly whittle down 70 people to about 10. It's like, I can never work with you, 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 and you. There's a whole bunch of people that we're just not compatible with because we are too similar. And they let all 70 do this. They let yeah. all 70 of you create your own sub-networks inside the 70 to see what your teams are going to be. So you do like a level of speed dating over a period of time with 70 of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so these group challenges would be in sort of groups of six and they'd they'd arrange them. You'd go and do your, your task. You'd pitch back to the room and you'd get feedback and you, you kind of understand how people work and you would swap groups. You know, you do one in the morning, one in the afternoon, maybe have a masterclass one day, you'd then do another one. And that was sort of the first so what was the outcome? They'd end up with eight, nine, 10 companies kind of out the, the 60 or the 70 you're selected together so you all want to work together and they've got then eight to ten squads to do something with basically yeah so I think twenty I think 25 teams were formed in our cohort which is quite a lot all 25 pitch and in our cohort I think seven got investment from Antler and went on to the next stage and then you're sort of on a six month kind of program again where it's kind of structured to support you so you got t- 25 went through the 12 weeks bootstrapping yeah, so all, all, all 70 founders stay for the 12 weeks yeah. if you're not in a team solopreneur some people some people actually got, got through yeah. on their own uh, one person got through on their own uh, I think uh, but it's very uncommon that's been unusual I don't like anyone I work <laughs> on my own <laughs> yeah but I think it was just she was so compelling and her story and her journey and her drive was like so strong it was if anyone could be a solo founder it's it you her, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think she's been quite successful she, we don't keep in touch as much as I do with the other founders um, but uh, yeah I think I think it's going well f- for them um, and so those individuals who didn't get into a team or didn't have a business to pitch drop off mm-hmm. and then there are 25 teams that actually pitch so you know it varies from cohort to cohort and, and seven got got the, the money at the end of the, the program and uh, Antler's terms are on their website and what they what kind of they offer so um, if anyone wants to look it up you can go look it up um, but it's it's not a huge amount, but it's enough to keep you going for a while and, and try and find that product market fit um, and then raise your next round of funding. And Antler's great at uh, putting you in touch with their network and introducing them they, to investors. So what do they determine that as when you get 12 weeks in, get the investment for seven of you, what, what do they consider that bootstrap, pre-seed? What, what round do they, do they label that as? I think it's labeled as pre-seed. It's pre-seed funding round. Yeah. Okay. And then... That was what turned into Mast. That that is Mast. Yes. So we were Catalyst with a K for a few weeks, and we quickly dropped that because that was a terrible name. Um, I wanted to go for Crocodile and like a lime green color scheme, but that got that got slammed down and said, "Why, why, why Crocodile?" It was it's really lame. But the idea of the product was supposed to improve lenders' margins on both sides of the equation. Great, greater than, less than. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then it's like a crocodile. That's how they it's yours. The maths, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just thought it was it was so different to everything else in the marketplace. It was a little bit fun. You could get a bit creative with like a logo that really stood out and had brand recognition. But we went with something a bit more sophisticated and professional in the end. So why masked? 
uh, we were we wanted a short, snappy name that could be easily said, and you could easily Google it. Um, we didn't see anyone else using the name. It was four letters, um, and there was a there was a URL available, so we we took it. Which, as you've often found, is a lot of the reason the names are picked actually nowadays is is has the URL or the domain available for us to get what we need. Yeah, yeah. a, a reason. There's, there's all kinds of ideas that happened before that, but then until can we get the web page? Yeah. Yeah. Master, you would have thought Master would have been gone, given like. So mast of a ship or satellite mast or mobile phone mast. So there is a masttechnologies.com, which does like radio antennas in the States somewhere. Uh, there's a mast.com, which is owned by like a cosmetics company, but it's got like an empty website. And we took use mast.com. So you got no, there's no backstory with mast then other than we just said the, it was practical. Yeah, yeah, nothing. There's no kind of alliteration behind it. Or, uh, sorry, it's not a acronym. Um, acronym. So thank you, yes, uh, or anything like that. We were just, I think we were thinking about boats and we were thinking, are there any parts of a boat? I can't remember how we got into this. And we were sort of like, well, the mast is the center of the boat. It's where the sails hang off. Yeah. And the idea was that mast becomes kind of the center of the mortgage lender. And So you got the, the, the pre-seed round what was that what round are you up to now so we did a seed round sort of two months ago right. um, and we in between we did a couple of sort of friends and family type angel kind of not angels um, we really struggled to get people to invest in us after uh, the end of the round they didn't believe that we would sell to a lender they didn't think that this was a problem that could be that needed to be solved or could be solved they thought how are you going to sell to a lender when you're just three guys in the basement of a WeWork. <laughs> uh, which WeWork are you in? Uh, we are now in Chancery Lane, but we've done the rounds. We've done Hoxton as part of Antler. We've done Chancery all- Lane's a one over by the Prudential buildings, isn't it? All the um, terracotta coloured buildings. It's not that one. Oh, it's not that one. Uh, not Waterhouse Square. We are on Chancery Lane itself, oh. opposite um, Saatchi and Saatchi, yeah. um, with a very expensive but very nice pub next door called The Pregnant Man. Started my career in London in the late 90s just at the top of Chancery Lane mm. working for a legal software provider um, so when did you when you launched your product so uh, we started building as soon as we had the money from Antler we we were doing kind of like wireframes up until um, the, the investment committee when we got the money it was like right let's build this for real and we would demo it to lenders and get feedback um, and then we I mean you, 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 you kind of we had the system it's kind of ready to go but we didn't have a production environment live with a lender so how did your journey feel- start did you so you you built the product did you did you build it intentionally to con- and go out intentionally just for research or was it always could we sell it at this stage kind of engagement and oh no we can't yet so we're developing a bit more can we sell it now yeah maybe if I go back a bit further and that'll make a bit more sense so um, whilst we were on that 10 week program with Anla, we were in touch with a few lenders and we were getting feedback. You know, this is our idea. How do we refine it? How do we make it work for you? And the general consensus was um, you need to build a broker portal. A broker portal is effectively how brokers apply to mortgage lenders. They go to a website, fill in a form for the customer, attach some documents. And um, my the original idea that I had kind of was similar to this, um, but but this was the the smallest piece that we could build and sell to a lender on its own, if that makes sense. So we were like, well, let's start with that. Let's build the most basic version that has this key USP that we think no one else is doing. Go out and see which lenders are interested, and we had some really positive conversations. Whilst we were in that ten weeks, we thought that there was one lender that were were keen to pilots with us he was looking for your MVP basically wouldn't he exactly know. yeah if you've um, audio book or reading uh, Lost and Founder by Rand Fishkin no I haven't that's quite an interesting book he's the he's like the godfather of SEO mm-hmm. um, and he, he started Moz SEO and it talks all through his up and downs and, and he, he turned um, MVP phrase into EVP like exceptional value product it's not just enough to get your minimum valuable product you need the exceptional value piece however small it is it needs to have exceptional value to get people to buy it so yeah and I ask us our key USP is that we tell brokers the lending policy of a lender 
whilst they key in an application. So the, the biggest problem that a lot of lenders face is that the applications they get in are outside of their lending criteria. It's missing information, there's missing documents. And none of the systems on the market tell a broker that this stuff is missing before they submit. So you improve the success rate of the submissions and the speed of exactly they can apply every- because it's real time feel real time feedback on the form. Exactly. And every lender was telling us if you can give us better packaged applications, which is kind of the industry terminology for you know, how well is it put together, we can do, we can keep our operations exactly the same and we'll process applications much, much faster. So what's the, would you guarantee your customers percentage of right first time increase? Or We estimated that we would do uh, a 25% improvement in underwriting time. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually really hard to track because we don't see what happens in the back office so it's hard to track those time scales so you're looking at 25 percent improvement so once the person has filled out the form and it's gone to the underwrite the the less time they waste because it's right more often when they get it exactly yep um but with our first client we have improved their um conversion rate by 30 percent. so it's gone from somewhere in the 50s to somewhere in the 80s so how do you how do you sell the product what's the the usp on that um, but there's there's typically some metric you, you go to market with around benefit yeah. outcomes and so the, the the challenge for us this sort of a two part one the, the the challenge for us was always integrating with existing systems that lenders had and we just weren't really able to do that at the stage a lot of them have legacy systems that we just wouldn't be able to integrate with so we focus on lenders that were paper-based today and there are there are mortgage lenders out there that still rely on brokers to fill out paper forms so we sort of aggressively targeted those ones and said here is a better for version of your form online brokers can fill it in and it's not just an online pdf it's like an actual proper website where they can track stuff so that was sort of the, the first step of, of tackling uh them and the second one was we, we really just focused in on this idea that if you get a high quality application from the start. The whole process is easier. The broker enjoys the journey more. The customer gets a better response and you can lend faster. And we really focus on this idea that we would improve the conversion rate of applications. And also actually the thing that really resonated with lenders was our invention of the hard stop policy. So the hard stop policy is a rule that you set and you basically if the broker triggers this rule, they can't even submit the application. We just say the lender just says no, and I'm not even going to bother looking at it. So, so it's like a, it's like a mandatory set of primary questions that if you fall foul of that, you then you're you're out. Like you, with that condition, you're out, kind of thing. Exactly, and you know there were systems out there that did this to a basic level. So the, the classic calculation in a mortgage is the loan to value. What's the loan compared to the the value of the house? And you know lenders have rules. You know nothing over ninety five percent, or on this product, it's you know eighty five percent. Well, we went much, much more granular than that. And we went really precise on really detailed lending requirements around sort of the credit history of an applicant. And the lenders that we were showing this to were like, they were kind of blown away. A lot of these smaller lenders have very intricate lending criteria. They find their niche, but that means that they have to ask a whole host of questions and brokers have to keep up with- Longer form, right? Longer form and brokers have to keep up with hundreds of lenders. So understanding every lender's little detail criteria, they're never going to be able to do it. And we kind of tell them, like we sort of put them on rails. But the broker can't get it wrong if we tell them, you've broken the policy or this is the policy. You can't hit submit, we're sorry, go somewhere else. Um, and that's been that's been great because it just means that, like I said, the conversion rate goes up, the underwriters at the lender aren't spending as much time on these DUF applications. Um, so that's been a, a really positive outcome for us. Do you inject anything into the the form or is it just question based? I mean, so you mentioned then about credit checking and stuff like that. Do you have feeds in uh, to in real time analyze the actual detail that's being put in? That is coming soon. Um, it's a really big request and a lot of, a lot of systems already do this. Typically not at sort of the lower end of the market, the top end of the market, if you go to, you know, there, are, there are lenders that can kind of give you an instant decision really quickly for quite vanilla lending. Um, and we're trying to do it for really complex. kind of complex cases. Um, there's quite a high upfront cost in working with the credit reference agencies and kind of building that integration is not cheap. Um, but we're at a position now where 
we can do that. And so we're looking to do that in the next couple of months, which is actually really exciting. So what will the, the credit agencies be? The, the the standard sort of consumer ones, like the experience yeah. and all those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we, we do we do similar with um, Dun & Bradstreet, uh, company level, rather than an individual. It's a, a company assessment. But we, do, we do have a few APIs that we build into the form. So, you know, the, the classic one is you know, the postcode lookup. That's an API to someone providing that service. We have a, uh, a company's house API built in, so you pump in the company's house number, you press the button and we pre-fill the form. Um, and we've also um, do a bit of um, OCR, so obstacle character recognition. Oh, yeah. So brokers can upload a document and we'll extract information from that document and put it in the application form just to try and speed things up for them as well. So we have a few, few nice features there. So when you went from wireframe to actual building a product, um, Who's your developers? Are you, did you have to go and get in developers, or you pick some of that up yourself? Or? So we're a three. Per, we were a three-person team, and one of our co-founders, Henry, uh, is our CTO. Yeah. He used to work at Thought Machine. He used to work at Pivotal, and he is a fantastic developer and churns out great code all the time. Um, and he basically built the first version of the portal from scratch himself. And yeah. Uh, we we loved it. We we tried working with a developer who was in Hungary a few months ago, who was remote. It just didn't it didn't quite work for us. We loved having working in person, um, and we've kind of made the decision that we are never going to use an outsourced development house. Um, so for any anyone listening who wants to message me selling me their outsourced developer services, you can uh, close that LinkedIn message now. I'm not I'm not going to bite. Um, We'd rather have people in house that you know we're going to incentivize to to stay with us for the long term who really believe in the product. It is uh, minefield outsource development in terms of getting the right the right partner. Yeah, and I absolutely believe that if you're doing a product or you want an MVP or stand something up quite easy, go for it. But if I'm going to be honest, mortgages are complex. It's this sort of weird detailed stuff that we don't understand, and you know it takes you have to read through MCOB ten times to get it and then there's a bug and, you, and, you, and you're just writing a user story and expecting someone to deliver and understand what you, what you want I think that's just really really tough you're, you're chief product officer at the moment chief right? product officer yeah, so yeah. I've, yeah. Uh, I've played with all those titles um, I was the chief product officer and the CISO um, yeah so this year just moved me to a, a CMTO which is a, a merge of as you do in startups you, you you very rarely can wear one hat so that's part of the, the, the fun of it though right it's the the end-to-end part so yeah so yeah. yes so i'm uh got marketing and technology at the moment we what size are you You're still three people we are four now so it's still really small um and we are hiring two people one in august one in september so the team's growing still looking to hire more um Actually, one of the challenges with with building system and rerun rails is there aren't I think there are a huge number of um, developers with uh, experience in it in London. That's what I understand. It's, it's kind of tricky to recruit for generally, mm-hmm. um, and there are some big. So it's, it's tricky to recruit for it because there's not a huge amount of talent that that no Ruby on Rails, and there are a few big employers like I think Deliveroo was all on um, Ruby on Rails, and I can't remember who else. Someone else. Like a big unicorn, yeah. So uh, they just kind of scoop up all the talent, yeah. If they, if they can get there, so that uh, makes it tricky. So yeah, onshore UK developers are really hard to find. Um, I've had ex-colleagues uh, in, in companies that have been looking for a developer for eighteen months, and you, you obviously want the best that the market has to offer. It's such a fluid space. Um, that unlike what you were saying, we did through past startups and and past um, acquaintances having slightly longer career than yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, know some good guys that run their own uh, offshore opportunities. So we work with a, a local guy in, in the UK. Uh, that's a serial entrepreneur himself um, who worked with a guy who's now back in Argentina. So we have. Uh, quite a few developers a dozen or so out there I think that really makes a difference if you know if you know the people that you're working with or you know the head of a team and there's that really strong communication yeah. that's going to make all the difference so I, I totally understand that um, I think for, for us it almost felt like we weren't like we weren't 
that connected to the to this person yeah. offshore it needs one thing that we've been really focused on is um never treating them like a off never treating them like a partner yeah. never treating them like they're offshore always treat them like they're employed employees as much as possible within the, the, the laws of the, the tax etc but from a cultural level that they are they are our team mm. right so that everything we go through from a, a colleague perspective we put them through as well it's not just a, a nameless bunch of de- or a faceless bunch of developers it's through an account yeah. manager it's a it's a fully integrated team and if you didn't if to your point i agree with you if you didn't know the person had previous with them and could trust them implicitly and had that fully integrated model it can be a nightmare i think we, i think it's we sort of went on like a I think it was one month or two months and the idea was that we we sort of test test the water and if we liked him we'd go full time and the plan was if we if we did that we'd either fly him out to the UK or we'd go and visit him and do like an onboarding weekend where we kind of get to know each other and really get hands on um, but we just, the, 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 there wasn't a match there um, and the, the, you know we hired it took us six months to, f- to find our first developer but he was just so good the quality of what he was again delivering was so high we just thought there's no, we're not, we're not. There's no return on the investment in, in, in the, in the offshore developer that we should just focus where where, where we know we've <laughs> we've hit gold. So yeah. that's kind of how we've gone. So customers, mm-hmm. how many net now have you got to? So we have one customer live at the moment, um, but we're talking to to lots more, and we're quite optimistic about uh, what the next six months looks like for us. Um, what's been great though is you know getting that product in. You know, a live environment and getting real customer feedback, talking to brokers who are using it, and that's really helped us refine what we've built and improve it. So that when we speak to the other lenders, the conversations progress much faster. How much of a responsibility do you have on any of the, the sort of standard regulations that are out there? So, I never was in the the, the mortgage space, um, but it was in the banks at the time of investment and wealth in terms of things like MIFID. Mm-hmm. came and dropped which was like transparency of portfolio management and where your requests go from the front site can you log in and see where your 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 processes are being or, or how your money is being processed do you, do you have similar things on the mortgage side of things that you have to take take care of or so the mortgage side the big one is mcop which is the mortgage conduct of business rules um and those rules apply to lenders and credit intermediaries they don't sh- like strictly apply to us because we we don't interact with the customer directly. Now, what happens is is that we we deliver documentation that is used by the credit intermediary and the lender, and so we ensure that we match what MCOP says we have to do. So, so, so Mast is a platform that sits between. It's not Joe Public that's using it to apply for a mortgage. It's yeah. a broker behind that. That's, yeah. that's using it's using mast yeah, we didn't cover that I thought we should have covered yeah, that so, yeah so I'm getting I'm getting the thing so the same sort of thing as like a, 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 an insurance IFA like an uh, independent financial advisor turns around and uses a product that's it yeah yeah, yeah. so um, at the moment a broker logs onto mast to submit business to our customer which is lender yeah. we're effectively sort of a white labeled front end for that lender um, and the broker can track their cases in mast and the lender also can kind of go through the origination journey in mast and update the broker ask questions um attach documents so, so where does where does mast end and you pass off to a an internal system i take it yeah so we we pass off into an internal system when the loan's been approved and the funds have been released that information then flows to a core banking system and then it's tracked and and monitored in there for the servicing side of things so is master with a want for an overused word it's omni-channel oh, yeah so technically we are uh, just the way that the way the, the the platform's built is you can open it on your phone and and it, and it runs and it works and i'm going to be honest filling out a form on a phone on any website isn't particularly pleasant i, I guess maybe except type form but you you wouldn't want to submit a mortgage application through type form um and yeah, so we we're kind of talking to lenders around having it in branch as well. You know, it, it's it's just a it's a web app effectively, like a kiosk basically. Yeah, so so anyone can just kind of log in. It, say anyone, anyone at the lender can could log in wherever they are and take a customer through a journey. You know, they could do it on an iPad, side by side on a sofa, which is probably a bit more um, personable than than sat behind a screen. And it's all 
it's all rules and and data led there's no like in in the application chat or assistance or so we have live chat and that's actually run by us so oh, i'm so your live chat yeah so i'm checking my phone that's why you're checking your phone yeah <laughs> and our customers sure asking you yeah uh, so so if a broker messages us says how do i do xyz or where can i find apc we typically pick that up and there is a bit of a challenge there because we'll the broker will often want an update on their application. You know, I sent, submitted this a few days ago. What's happening with it? And we can't answer that because we're not part of the lender. I was going to say, is that part? Is that because that sounds like product support to some degree, and yeah. it's difficult to see where product support ends and it becomes lender specific questions. So there's almost there's almost a natural service option there by the sounds of it on the platform. Yes. Yeah, so you're absolutely right, and we do. You know, it, it's a balancing act of. How do I, how do I tell a, a broker that I can't help them in the nicest way possible and direct them to where they should go? Yeah. And we make this very clear with lots of messaging around it, but you still get the questions come in. It's like I'm really sorry, can't do it. Um, but we've built in a system uh, in our portal that allows a broker to message the lender directly on their application. So not just like a general open chat. It's like if you open the application, you send a message the lender picks it up and knows exactly what's going on. We have all the the backlog of well, the, the previous messages sent so the broker can scroll through and see what's happened. And that's kind of what we direct the brokers to use if they want if they want if they want to talk about a specific application, use that. If they want to understand how to do something, talk to us by the live chat. But it is tricky. It's it's a challenging bit. So it's one one customer at the moment, lots more in the future. Hopefully, um, as I'm sure you, you will be successful in. What's the what's the mission? What's the if I was to ask you the mission of Mast? Where are you going to end up? What's the so um, we think that there's a real gap in the market to serve smaller building societies and complex lenders in the UK, and we kind of want to be the the go to partner there. We think we're the, the only the real kind of cloud native option that is forward thinking and at the moment we don't think there's anything else anyone else that will serve those clients in the way that we will the aspiration is to prove our you know credentials there deliver a great service and actually i quite like the idea of helping these smaller lenders compete with the big boys you know the big boys can pay for a slick digital experiences the small building societies are losing mar- are losing market share to them because they can't compete on the experience but if we can help them deliver the same kind of timelines and experience, you know, that, that's great for them. And, and it means we as a business grow our revenues by helping them grow. So I, I like that model. But the idea is obviously to work our way up the food chain and start working on more uh, more vanilla lending um, and in a wider range of scenarios for the larger lenders. Um, and that's kind of where our focus is right now. We don't want to spread ourselves too thin. Um, I think, you know, one day, we would love to look at options in Europe. Maybe we'd investigate other lending products, or maybe we do savings. That's you know, the other side for building societies. Um, but it's difficult because as a startup, you've only got a certain amount of runway. And whilst you need to sell that vision to an investor that's maybe five or ten years down the line, you've really got to focus on what you can deliver in the next, you know, twelve to eighteen months potentially. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always uh, my 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 father had run companies for all of his career he only very fleetingly for a couple of years worked for someone else and he'd always been like what, what you'd refer to as an entrepreneur mm-hmm. nowadays but it's in, in heating engineering and um, it was always a case of you can't get the startup model right because uh, especially the VC back startup model because it's always a case of you was running and building a business over a longer period of time um when you explain to them about VC back startups never becoming profitable because they just get money, go again, money, go and go again. And that was, was, it took me a few goes over a couple of years to, to get him through the, the thinking on the, the, the OPEX versus <laughs> RevEx model and that, the, the, the hockey stick return kind of, uh, visual, visual that you, you get with VC backed organizations. Um, so it is, it was it was strange for me coming into it in 2015 in terms of learning, having been, what was it like I said, late 90s, always been working for someone else. But because my father was entrepreneur, I always had that, could I work for myself? 
could I see the gap there? Could I could I do or understand the end to end runnings of a business? I think I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to do that over the last seven years, and uh, I definitely uh, fail or succeed. Um, I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, so, what would your advice be for anyone looking to do what we've done and move out of a, a, a role, cushy or not? Yeah, to go um, go it alone or. My mum, I always told my mum that I wanted to be an entrepreneur and she said most people that do it, they work for someone else and then they realise that they can do a better job than the person paying them to do it. I wouldn't say I fit into that category, but I worked and for a big company and I could see the problems and I could see uh, how I would improve systems and there was no way that I was ever going to be able to do that as a grad in a mortgages team. Like It's not going to not going to happen. Mm. Like uh, even as a VP or even as a director, it's probably going to be pretty tough to, to do that. So, um, but great eye opening experience. And I would say, I would say to anyone who wants to, anyone who wants to become an entrepreneur would be go work for a big company and go and find out what they still use Microsoft office for, because I can tell you, they're going to use Microsoft office for something they shouldn't be. And when you find that build a product that serves that, that purpose, you'll know who the customers are. You'll know, you'll, if you've experienced the product yourselves, you'll be, you, you know, you'll know there's some product market fit there. You'll have a good idea. Um, that would be my, my starting point. Um, I talked about the underwear idea earlier. I know nothing about underwear or manufacturing. And yeah, I experienced the problem, but I was a sample of one. Um, it's, it's, yeah, you're never gonna sitting at home thinking of ideas in the pub. It's, it, it's really tough to come up with a compelling idea. Although I, I do say that my my cousin's ex boyfriend's dad is the founder of Love Honey, and apparently him and his mates were just in a pub one day and just like this internet's a big thing. What should we sell online? And they just went, "Now sex toys." What sales? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's so maybe it does work for some people, but for me it was it was um, find a problem in a corporate and, and nail it. And oh, I know at least one other uh, antler company in my cohort was exactly the same. Another guy in Barclays had this problem and was like, this is the software we need to, to build to solve this and has gone away and done it. Sage advice. Um, you, you, you do get somewhat of an accelerant uh, learnings from a big company when you join them and, and, and the ways of the, in which they work. It's funny you mentioned going to go and look at what they use for Microsoft Office because that's part of the reason we built Brooklyn. Um, replaces a lot of the stuff that's done in all Microsoft Office products. There you go. And there was a phrase that through my career, having worked in infrastructure and technology, was UDA was the the, the the acronym, and it was end user developed applications. So when we did large migrations, changing of tool suites, moving of Office versions before it was all in the cloud. Yeah. You'd have to go out and look, especially on trade floors, and look at what some trader or some back office person that actually developed what is akin to an application sitting inside of Excel or, or sometimes if they had access uh, um, installed access I don't know if you remember Microsoft access was like a database local running version and yeah they got quite powerful some there were some parts of the business running on things that a, a single employee had built in Excel or scary yes yeah, it's, it's and when stuff falls over we had a price I probably shouldn't give away too much but uh, we had a tool at Barclays that everyone used on a daily basis multiple times incredibly slow everyone hated it I think basically a glorified Excel sheet with a nice front end on it yeah. <laughs> just like how is this business running on this thing yeah. um, it makes no sense but, but it's, that's it the world of the world of large corporates okay. honestly you, you peel back the layer on, on, on some of the biggest companies in the world and I the, the amount of blue tack and, and tape and string holding them together give you a heart attack. Absolutely. I think mean, so I've, I've worked for a fair fair few of those organizations and one one particular that you have. And um, anything that's been around that long and that has acquired that much and is that big, there are spaghetti nests of things that live within them in a technical sense that are, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember earlier in my career where we worked in some cases where we ended up talking to local European universities to do courses on something that had become obsolete so we didn't have to change change it. 
So you're basically training the next generation in old obsolete tech to keep it alive. Yeah, bizarre. Such a backward way of doing things. Say what, if you're a COBOL engineer, you're in luck because the number of bank systems written in COBOL and like some 70s. I think they're bringing back COBOL engineers out of retirement to keep systems running. So Core banking platforms are um, inherently... Uh, challenge but yes yeah an opportunity at the same time so from a startup perspective customer one um when your next round are you looking for i guess it's probably going to be driven by when we hit the kind of the revenue metrics that the investors will look at i i would love it to be in 12 months or 12 to 18 months um because i think at that point we'll have had enough of a track record that we can start tackling larger lenders yeah. there's obviously an inherent risk that you know if you go with a really young startup that they're going to implode and that kind of means that selling to top five top 10 top you know top 30 lenders is gonna be really tough but with sort of two years of track record a good amount of funding we can really start actually start to aggressively tackle those lenders so i'd obviously let's see that sooner rather than later but i reckon maybe a more risk more realistic timeline is sort of around 18 months to two years are you going after the the atypical model that vcs like which is that triple triple double double triple 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 double double there you go yeah we'd love to hit those 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 kind of returns but we know that selling in financial services is tricky and it's kind of a bit of a slower process you know the sales cycle for us is a little bit longer than other industries so maybe hitting those numbers is going to be challenging but then as i said earlier we're really hoping that the lenders that we do on board will grow themselves and so we'll get a bit of like organic growth there that someone comes onto the mass platform they underwrite faster, they deliver more loans, they grow, and we get a bit of growth that way. Have you have you worked out that sort of um, customer success or are you working there at the moment, that, that journey that, that you'd put a customer on to get it in, get it in at a reasonable amount, not necessarily a proof of concept, but mm-hmm. just a... Like how they like the the best practice around digital transformation. Take a small slice of something, transform it, and then look at how you'd replicate that out across the business. Yeah, so I mean, we we just do it for for mortgages for one customer at the moment, but obviously we want to expand that to different types of mortgages yeah. for different customers. Expands, you know. I, I can imagine way. you'd onboard. You could onboard an intermediary or lender, not a lender. What's the what's the word of like the IFA position? Uh, yeah, an intermediary. Yeah, yeah, so you'd onboard an intermediary at a time, right, so to test it out, I suppose, is, a, is an option. Yeah, so it's, it's, the, it's the lender that kind of manages that. So we onboard the lender and then the, the brokers or the intermediaries are free to register, request access, and it's up to the lender to, to give them access. I mean, part of it, you're also constrained by uh, the lender's own restrictions. You know, they've got issues like the cost of funding, they've got returns to hit, they've got to think about their position in the market. Um and so they, they might want to grow, but they might be constrained in other ways. So it can be a bit of a challenge. There's, there's lots of things to, to think about there. Um, but we think that mortgages is a very challenging area of lending. And if we can nail this and do it really well, um, we will have proven that we, that we understand the financial world and that if there are other lending products that people want to talk to us about, we're there for it. I mean, we, we did some demos with... Um, not not one of the neo banks, but it's like one of the challenger banks that was set up post two thousand and eight, and talked to someone in the like the risk team, and they sort of said, "This is amazing. Could you do it for credit cards, car loans?" Yeah, it does sound like they've got um, anything with a less than straightforward application process. You have a technology that could uh, it could apply to, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we think that, you know, uh, there's lots of opportunities out there. Mortgages is kind of the well, that's what we're going to focus on for now. You know, double down on that, get nail that. Um, like I said, don't want to self-spread ourselves thin and give someone a bad experience mm. and then assess from there. So are we going to do it in five years? Uh, it's going to be really tough, um, but there are opportunities out there that, that, that mean we can get there. I think, I think if anything, we might go double, double, triple, triple, triple the other way around. Yeah. So um, the curve will get fast, will get steeper, faster, because the, the 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 scope and the number of opportunities will increase, the better our track record is, which is possibly kind of the inverse of yeah. of, of a direct to consumer model where you start to run out of customers. So how do you um how did you come up with the pricing structure? Uh, that was really tough. Um, so we we kind of charge on kind of like a per usage model where we take 
so in the mortgage industry, brokers get paid a commission on every loan that they send to a lender. So if you're, if you're a mortgage broker and you send uh, a loan to uh, whoever, they'll probably pay you 03 to 0.5% of that loan as a fee. And so we adopt a very similar model where if the loan comes through us, we charge a fee like that. Flat fee or percentage of loan? Percentage of loan. All right, okay. The great thing about that is it means that we can go to um, lenders of any size and say, this is the model. Um, this is how it works. It scales for lender. It's it's kind of fair. Um, and it, as, as I said, you know, as the lenders grow, we naturally grow our revenue as well because we're capturing a share of that. So we kind of pitch it as like being a real partnership. You know, we, we're really incentivized to help them do more because uh, we're going to get paid more. So we, we, we kind of, uh, you know, do everything we can to help them improve that conversion rate, speed up the decision, the time to offer. More volume, bigger deals, more exactly. bigger loans. Yeah. yeah. That's the strategy. So, so what's, what's, what's next? Just continue as you have been, like you say, double down on what you're doing from a mortgages perspective and just add customers. I... Yeah. So I mentioned that we started with this broker portal and that was the kind of the slim down version of the product. The reality is that we need we need to do a lot more of the kind of end-to-end journey. So we need to allow lenders to complete a lot more within our platform. And we're doing that now. We've, we've built out a lot in the last six months. Um, and some of those, some of that functionality that we've built is already being done in other systems with our first customer. So we're now kind of when we, when we were to be honest, we were doing RFIs and RFPs um, for other lenders who wanted a sort of a complete end-to-end system. And we were sort of in a halfway house where we weren't we weren't there yet, but it was going it's all on the roadmap. But we delivered more than just the broker portal. And so this year is really about getting the full the full breadth of the platform complete so that when that RFP season comes around in December, January, February, March, we can go and we can tick every box and say, yeah, with you know, we had to do everything that you need us to. Yeah. So that's kind of the big the big plan this year is really get that product development done and that will unlock a lot more opportunities for us next year and then i think um you know next year we'll be doing some slightly quirky or technically advanced features that people haven't thought of before uh, which will start helping us stand out from the competition even more i assume you've got an out of the box starting point like a vanilla request form do you do, do, do an element of tailoring per client or yep. is it quite bespoke we do bespoke. We do bespoke for every lender. It doesn't take too long to build a form, um, and we sh- we build the forms in a way though that means there is some um, similarities between them. So, uh, just makes it makes it much life easier um, when we onboard a new lender. Uh, but we don't we don't say this is the template you're using. This it's you know what you want. It's funny we get lots of questions like, oh, do you do this type of lending? And it's like, well. If you give us the application form and you tell us the policy behind it, yeah, we'll do it. It's not, yeah. you know, it's not, not tricky. And then you've got an element of analytics on the back of it. Yep, we do. Uh, we track the funnel and the pipeline of, of the lender. We track, you know, when, when do brokers log in, when's the busiest time, how long do pro- applications take to process, um, all that kind of stuff, really. Um, and obviously the, the the loans that we take a share of. So it's, uh, it's always fun watching that tick up as it did today, which was great. So how long have you had the one customer? It's coming up to nine months now. Okay. Okay. Um, it, it, it takes a while to kind of get the customers over the line and onboarded. Um, we've been working with another lender for you know almost six months now, and we're still 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 getting still going through the motions. But we, we think we're getting close. So it's a uh, it's a long journey, but but. You know, we understand that it's slow because the contract value is quite high. Um, they're spending a lot of money. There's a lot of risk involved in in taking this kind of system. We're processing a lot of customer data. They want to make sure they're making the right choice. What's the uh, the internal tools you're using to run your business? So CRM yet? Have you got one? So we use HubSpot, and Joy, my co-founder, loves it. Loves tracking emails, seeing when people read them, all that kind of stuff. Um, I I kind of hate using CRMs. I used to have, used to, have to do it at Barclays and. It was, you know, yeah, as part of your performance review, you have to you have to make five cool reports a week. And I was just like, my clients don't want me calling them. Like they'll 
they want to talk to me occasionally. Uh, and, and, you know, it's nice that I check in, but they do not want to speak to me for half an hour about nothing every week. Mm. So I ran over there. Um, <laughs> so we, we use HubSpot uh, and that kind of tracks everything. But I just I just write on a whiteboard. I've got a big old whiteboard behind me. I just write all the client names and who I need to talk to and who is responsible. That's my CRM. And I, I like using that. We're not at the stage where we've got 50, 60 clients that we're always tracking. So that makes yeah. life a bit easy. Uh, the big one that we use, which we love, is Basecamp. Right, yeah. And Basecamp is kind of a project management software where you can onboard clients as well and you can set up projects and teams. And it means that I can kind of put a document in Basecamp and let the client see it as well as our team. They can write comments on it. We can message each other. We can set up to-do lists. We can assign each other's ta- each other tasks. And it just means there's this one central repository. Collaboration product. Yeah. Exactly. And it makes life really simple. Um, I, know, I do like a weekly product update on there that the client sees. We then do a phone call and run through it. Um, and it just means finding stuff is so much easier than going through your inbox and trying to dig stuff out. So we love that. Um, and we also use a great bit of kit called Tracker, which is um, a tool that Pivotal built to use in-house. And it's, I guess, it's kind of like a Jira board and we write all of our user stories in there. You can tag them, label them, arrange them, and then you point them. So you estimate how much work it takes. And so every Monday morning we do a stand up, we all look at Pivotal, we all talk through the stories that we've set to discuss this week that I tagged as discussed yeah. in sprint planning. The guys will go through and point them and we then drag them into the prioritization list and then they work through them, you know, picking whichever ones they want. Tracker then says, well, this is your velocity. This is how many points you're doing a week. So this is what you should get done this week. Um, and it's just a, and you know, there's like approval and rejects mechanisms built in. Yeah. It's brilliant. Love using it. Um, don't know how we would do it without it. Wait, what are you wireframing in? We use Figma, um, which I quite like. Um, although to be honest, one of our engineers is so good at front end stuff. He just comes up with an idea and kind of plays around with it in a web browser and then yeah. we go, yeah, it's good. We had similar, we limited it in terms of we've done a bit Adobe, like the XD, some in, in vision stuff, but sometimes it was just playing around with it in like very basic mock-ups in PowerPoint Yeah. until we just got it across to the developer and they started yeah. riffing on it. There's nothing wrong with just drawing a sketch. A lot of drawings, yeah. Yeah, take a photo on your iPhone, send it on, like, you know, uh, I think for us as well, we're at, there's lots of things that we build and we don't, we don't have customer feedback on. We've got one customer, they're not, they're not using every feature all the time. And we understand that what we're delivering is going to change because the way we've built the, the, the product and, and the, you know, the technology we're using, we can push changes whenever we need to. So we're kind of not married to any of the UX that we, that we do, which is great. So we get their feedback says, so we don't know where this button is or it's kind of hidden. We change it and it, you know, that's that's fine. So, what's your um? Are you releases in terms of products? Are you a set cadence, CD, CI, like your your pipeline? Uh, we're like, incredibly agile, and I think we, strictly speaking, we follow, follow XP, which is extreme programming. It's the official terminology. We do a, a brand of it, which uh, I think is a pivotal uh, terminology. I'd yeah, expect well, being an ex-pivotal guy, you're all fully automated from code to production pretty much. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll deploy to production once, twice a week, maybe. Bug fixes on the same day. Um, we push lots of stuff to a staging environment every day. And we use like Heroku uh, preview apps for testing features. Yeah. So it's like a relentless stream of, of testing. And then we'll do like a, a bigger push to production yeah. pretty regularly, um, which is great because it means that you know, the lenders keep getting stuff all the time. And we know that there are other providers in our industry who promise a new update and it's six months or whatever. The roadmap is fully booked like two years up in advance where we talk to our client and, and we go, we've got these five requests from you. Which one's the most important one? Oh, can you do this one, this and this and this one? Yep. And then like three days later, we've done half of it and they love it and we can ship something really quickly. Yeah, we're still the same. Same. Uh, we backed off production releases to Tuesday and Thursday. Mm-hmm. Initially, we was doing all the environments like daily and intraday. But we uh, 
we release intraday to all the test environments, uh, daily to all the sandboxes and the demos, but then production, uh, we do Tuesdays and Thursdays. I think that makes sense, like having some sort of structure around when you deploy to production, because you're going to need to inform your customers and having that rhythm helps because if you're doing release notes or you're, you're sending out the communications, yeah. if, if you're, if you're you know, pushing to production every day, that's, that's, that's tough to keep on top of. It is, we've, we've had some decent discussions with customers around sort of the, the, the old school enterprise waterfall methodology, which was big releases, not very often, a lot of effort put into it yeah. and, and trying to work with them to get them away from that, which is if we release little often, you, there's no retrain requirement. There's no comms requirement really because it's such a a step gradual process as you move the button across here and there that you almost don't feel it changing. You do it now and then, but it's never it's never such a big bang change that you've got. Oh, you've rearchitected everything. I don't know how to do my job. It's a uh, oh, I occasionally notice that that has changed a bit, but I still know how to do my job on the platform. Completely agree. Like we're we're exactly the same. Um, uh, you know, if you if you do step by step changes, you, you don't get that that feedback. I've I've lost something as you said. Okay, yeah, you, you couldn't have put it better. Just the cost of change is just much improved. Um, thinking years ago, I used to see it all the time of people that, or companies have problems. They speak to the vendor. The vendor would go, yeah, you're on about eight versions out of date because you won't do the step change, and the more you put it off. For the ninth, tenth, eleventh version, it's just going to get worse, and I can't really help you unless you're in minus one, as per the contract states, kind of thing. Because we fixed it already <laughs> over there. Yeah, but yeah, definitely prefer the the more agile model. We're we're finding that that our potential clients are are, come, are on board with that too. We largely are. It's one of the differentiators we get feedback on. So, well, Rob, thank you for coming in today and having a chat around what startup life is like for you like I said it was a bit of a, a break away from the, the normal vendor management topics we get um, it's nice to know that there's someone out there sort of struggling in the same same ways that we are every day um, it's, it's, it's not for the faint hearted to be involved in startups but it's very very rewarding um, and every day there's always some emergency of some sort so it's not boring let's put it that way yeah I always say the wins are that much sweeter like the feeling of getting a first client like, you can't I can't put it into words like how monumental it is and then you know you, you'll never feel that way working for for a corporate even getting a promotion or getting a, like it just it doesn't compare to when it's your when it's your thing and you've, you've brought it to life I started working uh, for myself about the same time I had my first child and I've got two and I was looking back the other day at photos of me just in the family album with my daughter and I had no grey hair then <laughs> so I'm not sure over the last seven years it's being a father or start up life or maybe a bit of both that's given me a, a fair few grey hairs but I'm not there yet but I wouldn't change it they're coming soon I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> I thank you so much for having me it's been a pleasure thank you to keep up with the latest VendorOps news, subscribe here and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Links in the description below.